Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to the second channel and we're gonna read some more scary stories today. Really quick before we get started, I thought I would give you guys a little bit more insight into how I pick these stories and like exactly what it is, just so that people know that there's no particular order. I'm gonna start with that. So I just, I have over a 600, almost 700 emails in that inbox right now, which is so wonderful. I'm very, very grateful for that. The more stories, the better, right? And I am determined to get through most of them at some point. However, I just want people to know that like, and I didn't even get any questions about this. I just feel like it's important for people to know when they're writing my emails. I don't go like from oldest to newest or anything like that, but I don't have a bias when I'm going through the email. So I just like scroll randomly. I'll like kind of play a little like uh, roulette kind of thing and just like scroll randomly through that inbox. I'll stop on a section and then I'll click through a few of the emails, especially it also based on their length. Like I try to mix a couple shorter stories with some of the longer stories and stuff like that. So it really is a random thing. And I do skim them because I want to make sure that I can read the story and that it's appropriate for a video, of course. But I try not to read the full thing fully because I want to be surprised. I want to live react to it with you guys as I'm reading through. But I'm trying to make it as random as possible. I'm trying to make it so that anybody's particular story has about an equal chance of making it into a video. I think we should be able to get through quite a few stories this year because I am planning on trying to be more consistent. I know, easy, easier said. You guys are like, oh, Hannah, sure you are. But that is one of my goals this year is to be more consistent with these videos so that we can get out like hundreds of stories this year. So that's the goal. And all that to say is a new thing I'm going to add to the instructions down below. But if you guys could start adding a TLDR to the story, either at the top or the bottom, this is in no way required. It's not going to affect whether your story is picked or not. It's literally just to make it helpful for me to decide which video is best for it to go in. It's all behind the scenes logistics, but it would be very, very helpful if you could add a TLDR to the story just so I have a good idea of what I'm getting into so we can continue to have a lot of variety and be about an appropriate length. I'm going to stick to about videos that my goal is for that them to be 30 to 40 minutes. I know people would probably love hour, hour and a half story videos, but in terms of not burning out my editor, because those are very, very long videos to edit, I just like that length and I feel like it's better to be able to get more 30 to 40 minute videos out than fewer. It's hour, hour and a half is just so, it feels so long that I'm afraid that I will then procrastinate on making the video. So, okay. Sorry for the very long intro today. I'll be sure to add timestamps so you guys can skip this if you want to. The instructions for how to submit a story are always in the description below. Taylor always puts a little email thing right here for me because she's great. So that being said, let's read some of your stories today. This first story is a haunted doll story, which love haunted doll stories. I am like actively looking for those sometimes if I'm in the mood for like a creepy doll story. So let's read this one. Hi, Hannah. First of all, I just want to say I love your content. Thank you for taking the time to share our stories. My name is Florence and I have a quick story about a doll that terrified me throughout my childhood. So this doll was around three feet tall, made out of rigid plastic and realistic eyes and hair. It could stand up if you propped it against a wall. I couldn't find a picture of the exact doll, but I found a similar one if you want to share it. This is not the exact same doll, mind you, as referred to in the story, but this is a similar one. I just want to say when I was a kid, I remember when those three foot Barbies came out and I wanted one so badly. I thought they were the coolest thing of all time because they were like, it was like a life size Barbie, right? I didn't get one and my mom wouldn't get one for me. I don't blame her for that at all because it would have been so much it, a giant toy that she knows that I would have gotten bored of in a couple months. But still, I really thought those were cool. Those three feet doll. Anyway. Okay. Anyway, I'm not sure why, but at some point I started to become really scared of it. In fact, for years, I had frequent nightmares about it coming to life to try and kill me. I never told my parents about it, though, because I had this irrational fear that if they tried to get rid of the doll, it would somehow find her way back on its own. <laughs> kid logic, but also like I totally get that. 
So I would usually leave the doll propped against a wall in the corner of my bedroom, right next to a big chalkboard I rarely used. Sometimes the doll would randomly fall over, but I would always try to convince myself it was normal. One night I had a sleepover with my friend and since my friend was also scared of the doll, we decided to hide it in the kitchen right before we went to bed. We were thinking it would be less scary if it wasn't with us in my bedroom. That way the doll couldn't fall over and scare us. Well, as we were about to fall asleep, the big chalkboard that usually sat right next to the doll randomly fell over. It made a huge noise, so my friend and I both freaked out and hid under the sheets. But after a while, I started having trouble breathing, so I made a small opening through the sheet to poke my head out. That's so relatable. I don't know how people just hang out under the blankets. Like, when you see in movies and stuff, and couples are having romantic, like, little, like, we're under the sheets chatting with each other. <gasps> I can't breathe after, like... 10 seconds, if that. I cannot breathe under blankets. I totally get it. At this point, I was facing the door, and when I looked under the door, I saw the shadow of two small feet. They were too small to be human feet, so I closed my eyes and tried to convince myself that it was all in my head until I fell asleep. That's terrifying. After that night, I decided to leave the doll in my closet, but I swear sometimes the closet door would be open when I was sure I had left it closed. Years later, I finally got the courage to ask my mom to donate the doll, but the nightmares took a few months to fully stop, even after the doll was gone. Looking back now, I'm pretty sure I was just scared and an imaginative imaginative child and the doll most likely wasn't actually haunted. That being said, I can't help but have an irrational fear of dolls to this day. This story is so relatable to me. I also had a really beautiful porcelain doll. It was a don't play with this doll doll that both me and my sister got one. They were different, but they looked, you know, they were the same type and they were so beautiful. They were so pretty, but then I developed this fear of dolls. I developed my fear of dolls BT dubs because an older neighbor who I thought was really cool, we used to hang out with them, but they used to have, they had a terribly dysfunctional family. And this older girl, she was like a preteen and I was a few years younger. And she told us haunted doll stories. She told us stories about dolls moving and stuff like that. And it was, I... I was never the same after that. That's where I developed my serious irrational fear of dolls. And after I was scared of dolls, that porcelain doll that I had in my room, I remember distinctly one night I was trying to go to sleep and I opened my eyes and I saw her move from my dresser to my closet. Like I saw her actively move across the room. When I looked clearly, she hadn't moved. Like this was 1000% my imagination. Like this is me just freaking myself out so much that I was seeing things. But I distinctly remember that night and that poor doll had to go into a box and never displayed in my room again because I was so terrified of it. That being said, seeing the two small feet under your door is very creepy. I would be curious to know, you didn't mention this, but I would imagine you would have did, if you had like a little brother or little sister that maybe was wandering around the house and heard you guys freaking out. So they were like curious and walked up to your door is the only thing I can think of. Or like you said, maybe your imagination was just getting away from you because when you're a child and you're in that imagination stage of childhood and you're so terrified, <laughs> you can kind of manifest those types of fears in real life. But either way, that's a really creepy story. That would have scared me as a child for sure as well. I'm glad you finally got the courage to donate her and I'm glad that she never came back to haunt you. Okay, let's go on to story two. This one starts, Hi, Hannah. I've been a fan of yours since the beginning of this year, but I feel like I've been around for longer. I first heard you through your Welcome Home analysis video, and I have been along for the ride since. My name is Ryan, or you can call me by my pseudonym, Honey Toast. I'm a 17-year-old trans guy, he, him, and I live in Florida. Unfortunately, it's hot and transphobic as hell right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. I actually would like to, um, he goes on to say, I would like to not remain anonymous if possible. He posted a video on Instagram and linked that video in this story. And I saw on your pinned Instagram post that you had changed your name recently to Blair. I emailed you about this, but I haven't heard back yet as of filming. I'll put a correction on the screen if you do email me back and if I'm wrong for some reason, but I'm going to refer to this person as Blair because I believe that is now his name. So Ryan slash Blair, I'm, please let us know if 
that's not correct and I will fix it. So, okay, now let's get into the nitty gritty. Short disclaimer, all of these stories will be paranormal, just so you know. For as long as I can remember, I've been an avid believer that there is some force out there that's larger than life and our energies, the very things that make us us, don't just diminish into nothingness once our physical body dies. And for the longest time, I've wanted some bizarre, unexplainable things to happen to me that would make my life more extraordinary. I got my wish when I was at the ripe age of nine years old. One of my mom's guy friends were over at our house and he'd brought us kids. One was around my age and one was about five years old maybe. And my cousin who lived in our house was with us too. And we were kind of all besties. We were basically a little band of outcasts who stuck together and were hanging out playing with my Legos when suddenly several cockroaches came skittering out from beneath the couch. Terrifying. Worse than a ghost. We all freak out a little, but we carry on. The five-year-old kid of the male friend is very shaken up by the ordeal, but her fear only quintuples when even more cockroaches than the first wave come out from under the couch. Then we all run outside to the Lanai. Lanai. Lanai? I think that's how you say that. Where our parents are screaming our heads off. We tell our parents what we saw and they all come in and move the couch over in search of some crevice that they could have come out of. The friend's dad was an exterminator, which helped. He finds no sign of a possible hole that they could have carved in either the floor or the wall the couch's arm was pressed to. Nothing. But what's even weirder is the fact that the cockroaches were all gone mysteriously. Cross my heart and hope to die, we all to this day still remembered what happened that night and saw the same thing. In hindsight, I really think that there might have been some strange presence looming in the house, but I may never know since we soon moved out of that house after my parents were divorced, but maybe my dad, a very spiritual person who has a keen sixth sense, might have an answer for me. Years go by until my next major paranormal experience that I can fully remember. This time, we're in February of 2022. My family and I go to St. Augustine for the weekend and my uncle was getting married there. This is where things start to kick into gear with my ghost shit. We go to a strip mall in St. Augustine called Hedridge Walk where I buy my first ever piece of ghost hunting equipment, an EMF K2 meter. Immediately after we get back to our Airbnb, I scan the place for any presences, even with a more reliable tool, my dad nothing. Then a few days go by and it's the day we leave to go back down to my part of the state. Before our like five hour drive back down to town, we stop at the famous St. Augustine lighthouse where I capture some of the craziest, at least to me, and undeniable ghost evidence. I even have a video of it that's attached below. Okay. So this is the video that I was mentioning at the beginning. Uh, Blair posted this on Instagram and linked me to the Instagram. The video is a little too long to insert the full thing into this. I'll have Taylor just insert like the first few seconds of it, first 10 or 20 seconds of it. And then I'll have the full video linked down below for anybody who wants to view it. Are there any spirits here that would like to make their presence known? Please come here and touch my EMF meter. I don't know what to say. I'm talking to a thousand year old ghosts or a hundred year old ghosts. I don't know what an EMF meter is. So for context, I pulled out my phone and started recording because my EMF reader began spiking red suddenly and I wanted to see if I could catch it spiking before said ghost or ghost suddenly went away. Then a moment later, as you see, I walk up to a wooden chair and put my EMF reader to it and the EMF reader picks up something in the chair. Yeah. Oh, oh, there's a ghost in the chair. It's a ghost in the chair. It could not have been anything electrical because I tried putting this thing up to anything electrical and I have done it to every place that I've been to, but nothing would set it off. And also, as you hear from my commentary in the video, when the EMF reader goes back to green, when the ghost gets up from the chair, you can hear my dad and I say that we felt a cool breeze pass over our foreheads. Wait, I actually felt something on my forehead too. I felt something. Oh, I felt something. There was something in this chair and it moved past us. Like I felt like a cool breeze across my forehead. 
And keep in mind that there's no air conditioning, nothing else electrical aside from the lights with us. There's no open windows or anything like that. No people in the room with us. It was just my dad and I, and we both felt the same thing. My dad and I had some talks about this scenario, and I asked him if he felt any presence is down there with him, to which he said, yes, absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind. He begins that I felt one or more presences in that basement. I asked him what kind of presences he felt, to which he had a hard time describing it at first, like it was a dreadful, confused, scared feeling. I feel that something was wasn't right in the air of that basement, almost like a static electric sort of feeling when you know lighting is about to strike. I then told him that I too felt something that day, just like he had described. Okay, so that was story one. We're moving on to uh, his next story. So this next story is a real doozy and it happened just at the beginning of this year, literally the day after New Year's Day. This is by far the scariest thing that has ever happened to me in regards to ghost hunting. This is what I dub that shit crazy scary. My mom and I went to St. Augustine by ourselves for one day. We were supposed to go with my aunt and cousins, but my older cousin wasn't able to come with us, leaving just my mom and I to go by ourselves. We spend the day doing fun stuff like visiting Villa Via Zora, Zora, Zoreda, Zoreda, sorry, I don't live in that area, so I don't know how to pronounce a lot of these, where I learned about this insane ancient Egyptian cursed cat hair rug that apparently caused a dead cat to show up on the doorstep of the person who helped try and restore and clean this rug. That in itself was pretty chilling, and when I learned about it, I was utterly terrified and baffled that the rug, made of cat hair, had such ability to do something like this. But the cat hair rug became the last of my worries that night. That night, oh man, where do I even begin with the night of January 2nd? We went on our ghost tour, my mom and I, and our group was pretty good. Our guide was very informative, and I learned a lot about ghost legends of St. Augustine that I had never heard before, especially the old jail. And that... Hannah and audience is the very place where I swear I caught a picture of something that I cannot describe for the life of me. And this is what I caught a picture of. Now, I'm sure you may be confused as to what the hell you're looking at, as some people that I've shown this picture were also quite confused, but basically it's that big beige looking blob that takes up about half the picture. I promise you that was not my finger or anything else inside the jail cell. There was nothing in here, at least according to my eyes there wasn't, and my finger was nowhere near the camera lens when it was taken. I remember it so clearly. I didn't look at this picture until we were on the trolley heading back to the building where I met up for the ghost tour. And when I did, I realized that I had seen a similar looking shape just down the hall of the jail from where this picture was taken. When we entered the jail, I just randomly decided to take a picture of a random jail cell, not even thinking that I could catch anything. I just took a picture of one just for aesthetic and probably meme purposes. I didn't intend to catch a picture of some indescribable entity. We were then led into a room full of cells. A guy came into the room and talked to us for just a few minutes before leading us out and guiding us around the jail building. Whilst everyone else was filing out of the room, I lingered back for a moment longer to look into the cells to see if I can get a good look at them and the beds to see what kind of conditions prisoners were held in all those years ago when this was still an active jail. Then I saw something, something I know for sure wasn't the trick of the light, because as I so vividly remember, it was nearly pitch dark down there, and there was hardly any light, especially since it was the dark of the night when our tour happened. When I saw with my own two eyes was pretty similar to what I caught in the photograph of the jail cell. The only difference was, unlike the picture, this figure seemed to be standing, or at least in a more vertical position than the one in the picture. After I saw what I saw, I fucking booked it. I bolted out of the room and frantically searched for my mom, trying my goddamn best not to lose my shit. I was shaking from head to toe, but I couldn't tell my mom about what happened in there until we were in the trolley on the way back where I was reviewing my photos and found the figure in the cell. When we got back in the car, I let all my emotions out and bawled my fucking eyes out out of pure fear, but also some astonishment that I did manage to capture some of the most undeniable proof of ghost. I think I will ever get. I posted to my Instagram story about what happened, showing the photo to my followers. When I realized after zooming in on the picture, I saw what looked like some weird face. I asked other people if they saw it too. Some people said yes and some say no. A couple people said yes after I pointed it out, but some people like my mom and dad almost instantly spotted it. I got chills thinking about it or retelling the story because the feeling I got in the old jail were some of the most intense feelings I've ever felt. 
aside from an upset stomach after eating something I probably shouldn't have eaten, aka what I'm going through right now in the time I'm retelling this to you. Relatable. There's plenty more ghost stories and other generally scary stories I have from my family and I, but this will be all I share for now. If it makes it to the next scary stories video, I'll maybe share them, but that depends on if you want me to. Until then, Ryan slash Honey Toast slash Blair. Okay, so what he's describing is that this photo that he looked at later in the story, the way that the story structure, he realized that the thing in the photo is something similar to what he saw when he was exploring the jail cell that caused that very emotional fear-based reaction after leaving, which I I think that's what it is. So um, sorry, I got a little bit confused as I was reading it. Like I understood all the stories, but wasn't positive that it all related to this picture. But I believe what he's saying is that the photo depicted something very similar to what he saw while he was in there alone. And it really scared the crap out of him. And then he realized that he had it on photo later. Okay, so that's really interesting. The jail cell itself looks terrifying, even blurred like. I know it's blurred like that, but even if it wasn't blurred, I think that would be really terrifying. Huh. I don't know. Yeah, I don't really have a whole lot of opinions on it because like you said, if I was just looking at this 1000%, I'd be like somebody had their finger in front of the camera because I've definitely done that. I don't see a face. But I might just be looking at the photo wrong, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't think I'd be able to see that unless somebody zoomed in and like highlighted and circled the face for me to understand. But yeah, regardless, that's really interesting. This story, though, reminded me, this isn't completely related, but it reminded me of this conversation that I was having with one of my friends. Last time we went to an Airbnb, me and the other gal went out to get in the hot tub for a few minutes and we started talking about ghosts and if we believe in them and everything. And she surprised me because she's actually a lot more open to the concept than all of, we have this friend group from college that we all still hang out. They're like my, you know, second chosen family kind of group of friends and all the guys in the group, most of them, most of the guys in the group are all like, mur, 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 no ghosts. They're not real, blah, blah, blah. Like they're like, they're not even skeptical, like they're complete non-believers. And I kind of thought that she felt the same way, but she brought up a really good point of like, what if this whole like ghost thing and all these experiences that people claim are ghosts, like maybe ghosts, what we think of as ghosts aren't dead people. Maybe there is no such thing as a human dying and then coming back as a ghost. Maybe the thing that we think of as ghosts is timelines mixing up or another dimension or simply that human brains can only fathom so much. And it's this alternate thing outside of 3D, outside of our world that we cannot comprehend. But there are creatures around that we can't see all the time or it's another alternate timeline or alternate universe or something that is showing up in our universe and only you know we can't all see it all the time but perhaps it's not dead people but perhaps it's like these weird invisible creatures or humans from another timeline or another existence something beyond what we can comprehend if that makes sense I'm gonna be super honest here and I'm so I'm so sorry, Blair. Absolutely nothing personal towards you or anybody else. But I personally do not like ghost devices, ghost communication devices. I just don't believe them. I just don't believe in them. And that's just a very personal opinion of mine. Like no hate to anybody. If anything, Ouija boards probably scare me the most. But like, I literally have a Ouija board a couple feet to my left here that I found at an oddities expo that's from the 90s. Like, I don't play with it. I'm not a lunatic, but I just don't like the, like the, the bars, the little, like the metal bars that tap together and like the little recording devices and stuff. I just personally don't buy those. I'm not saying I don't believe in ghosts completely. It's just that I think that's a lot of human confirmation bias personally. And as for the photo, of course, I can only take your word for it that your finger was absolutely not in the way. And if that's so, that's terrifying. And I will say that even if we could explain this picture away, obviously, I totally believe your account that you were absolutely terrified and that you saw something. 
like obviously I can't speak to that. So again, I'm not saying anything about your experiences or anything like that. I guess what I'm trying to say is that your second story is definitely more chilling to me than the device that you, you know, the EMF device that you were using. I really, really like your second story much more because I just feel like your feelings, like your that emotional fear that people like that's just so visceral and that we can't control is just something undeniable. Whereas I feel like those devices, we can kind of poke holes in how they work. So yeah, anyway, but all that to say is that it wouldn't that be so strange. I know I've kind of gone way on a detour here, but wouldn't that be so strange if me and my friend were right and that ghosts aren't dead people, but they are just like this other thing from maybe the other side, not the dead side, but like from another side, just from another side or something that we can't comprehend or see, but yet is there. And like, what if you cut that on camera? I don't know. Or that, or the energy that you felt in the lighthouse, like maybe that is something related to that. I don't know. It's just all stuff that's interesting to me. Thank you so much for your story, Blair. Like I meant to just say thank you so much for your story. This was a really, really fascinating read. I would love to have my own experience like that too, because I am exactly like you where it's like, I I do like kind of feel, and after doing this job so long, like I don't believe 99.9% .9 of the TikToks that I see that claim to be ghosts, but I do believe that I have heard so many anecdotal stories that cannot be explained. And after doing this for so long, it's just undeniable to me that the physical stuff that we see can't just be it. There's got to be something, right? And it's made me less skeptical. And so I really appreciate your story because it's very much something that I would really love to like experience something like this too. And I mean, I know it's like really scary in the moment. Like obviously you had a very emotional, scary moment, but still like it's interesting because then it's kind of like it proves at least for your yourself, then you can really believe, you know? So yeah. Okay. We're going to move on to story three. I think that was our longest story today. So let's move on to story number three. So this one says, hi, Hannah, longtime viewer here. You helped me get through my university years and I'll always appreciate your amazing videos. So where do I begin? This situation happened when I was 18 or 19 years old, which would make it 2018 to 2019. I'm from the UK. And whilst I was studying biomedical science at college, which is like high school in the US, <laughs> Of course. Thank you for explaining that because I would bet have, I would have been very confused. I had a part-time job. I worked at Tesco on a schedule of 12 to 8 every Saturday and I really liked the shift pattern as it fit around my studies. Unfortunately, the only issue I had was that I finished at 8 and typically the sun is setting at this point during the summer and it's much worse in the winter. I had just finished a long day of work, feeling quite exhausted. I was preparing myself for a long 45-minute walk back home. As I was walking home, I walked through this quiet neighborhood I always walked through and is generally regarded as quite safe. There's a long road with houses on either side of the street and a small church at the end. With my headphones on, I walked down this street just admiring the sunset and feeling good about things. Out of literally nowhere, a red car that looks like an SUV comes around the bend and drives past me really slowly and I kind of side-eyed it like, what the fuck? I thought maybe they knew me or I knew them, but it was just so random. I remember looking in the car and seeing two male-shaped figures in the front. I carried on walking as it drove past me and I was a bit confused, but I just didn't think anything of it. I then decided to have another look behind me to see where it was and to my surprise, it had done a U-turn on the road nearby and was coming back towards me. At this point, I was pretty scared. I just remember my heart beginning to race and my breathing becoming very heavy, classic anxiety doing me no favors. I paused my music and began walking a bit faster because I had all these thoughts rushing in my head about what they could want having watched and listened to people who have had real life experiences similar to this. I just couldn't help but worry. The car didn't seem to be going at a fast pace at all. And from the corner of my eye, I noticed it slowly driving next to me. I carried on walking for about 10 seconds before I panicked and just bolted down towards a separate small street past the church where I knew there was an alleyway that I could escape down. As I was running, I could hear the car speeding up behind me and chasing me down the street. What the? 
I managed to reach the alleyway and I just kept on running. I was so scared. I remember turning my head briefly behind me and all I saw were the headlights of the SUV glaring at me. From the alleyway, I reached a big roundabout where one of the turnoffs had a large mound and I decided I would stay down there for a while just in case they were looking for me. I called my friend pretty shaken asking if I could come and see her. When I've told people this story, people think I'm just confused or seem to try to downplay my experience. I know what happened, I know what I saw, and it scared me so much. I have no idea what they wanted from me, and I dread to think what could have happened to me if they caught me, or if it was someone else that couldn't escape like I had. To this day, I always think about it when I'm walking alone, and I hope that other people have never had an experience like that. Thank you so much for reading this, Hannah. I just wanted to say you're an amazing YouTuber, and I respect you so much. Oh, thank you. Have a lovely day, Liam. That is terrifying. Um. I, listen, I hate it when people downplay stuff like this and I get why. And I have talked about this experience, I think even on this channel, so I'm not gonna get really deep into it, but I did have a very similar experience where I was driving home from Seattle. I don't live in the city. I live on the other side of the water from Seattle. I was probably in like my mid twenties and these two young guys just, started tailgating the shit out of me. It was the middle of the night. I was a little bit lost. I was, my GPS wasn't working and I was trying to figure out how to get back on the highway. If anybody's driven around Seattle, you know that it's insanely confusing. There's like all kinds of weird intersections and one-way streets and like all these weird things that it looks like you can go down that way, but you're not supposed to go down that way. And I don't know if these two guys caught on to me or what happened, but there was these two young guys and they were not just following me. They were like this close to my car. They were tail, I could not see their headlights. They were tailgating me so hard. And like the second I turned somewhere, they were turning and like literally right behind me. I was so scared and I finally ended up pulling over and they pulled in behind me. And that's when I pulled out my phone and I was about to call 911 because they pulled over too. Like I was trying to let them pass me because like hoping they would just leave me the fuck alone. And instead they pulled over too. And then they finally drove away after I pulled over and was like pulling out my phone again to call 911 because I thought I was going to be essayed, if not worse, you know. They left and nothing ever came of it. And I'm sure those boys thought it was hilarious. I'm sure they thought that it was so fucking funny to make a young woman feel like she was gonna die. Don't do this shit. I don't care how old you are. It's not fucking funny. And it's not a, just a funny prank that you can do with your buddies to make you feel like all high and mighty. I don't understand why that's a funny prank. And it's not just me. It's this story we just read. And I've heard it from other people too, of people of typically men I don't know the gender uh, uh, identity of this person, but like it's typically men on women. It could be men on men or what have you, but typically it's men taking advantage of the fact that women are vulnerable and they do feel scared being alone at night in places. And for some of them, that's just so fucking funny. Ugh. Okay, so all that to say is that I have also told people about that story and some people that understand, like other women, are like, what the fuck? That is so messed up. Are you okay? I'm so sorry. There was even another woman that stopped by next to me on the road when we were at a light and she also like gave me a look of support. Tell any guy this story and they're like, it was just some guys being idiots. That's all they say. Like they don't, it's not that they're trying to be malicious or minimize your fear, they just don't get it. They just do not understand because it's never happened to them and it probably will never happen to most of them. <sighs> yeah, so anyway, all that to say, Liam, this person, I totally understand the absolute shit pants fear. And like, I can't even imagine in your case because you weren't in a car. Like <laughs> you were not in a car. You were out on the sidewalk. Like at least I could lock my doors so that I had time to call the police and stuff. So I can't even imagine being vulnerable and not being in a vehicle and stuff. And I just, yeah. The moral of this story is that I totally believe you. I think this is the most terrible. I would have cried and I'll probably peed my pants as well. And I think the most important thing for men, women, anybody, is that when your friends tell you stories like this where it sounds terrifying, even if it doesn't sound terrifying to you, they wouldn't be telling you unless it was really scary. So like, just validate people's feelings. Like it goes a really long way to just say, oh my God, I bet you were terrified. 
Like, it, that means so much to somebody telling a traumatic or scary story. Just validate them and say, like, I totally believe that that happened to you. Like, that's all we need. So I can understand this person's frustration of feeling like when you try to tell people, they're just like downplaying it or minimizing it or trying to be like, oh, well, maybe they weren't even following you and you just thought they were. And it's like, no, people know when somebody's following them. Okay. Wow, this video, <laughs> speaking of 30 to 40 minute videos, this one's probably gonna be longer than that, but I'm sticking with it for most of the videos. Okay, let's move on to the fourth story for today. So this one says, hi Hannah, please keep this anonymous, but I wanted to share my story. I grew up in the rural Appalachia and when I was about five, my parents found the deal of a lifetime. They found a 40 acre farm that an elderly couple had wanted to rent, but then offered my parents the chance to buy. Of course they jumped on the offer. My twin brother and I loved it. This was about a 100 year old farm and with all the old buildings to explore, woods, fields to play in, we thought we were in heaven. Oh, I love childhood. I remember those days when it's like, even when you have a big backyard as a kid and there's like a tree or a little kind of forest, like it's very exciting. There's a lot of imagination games you could play with your friends in those places. Everything was great about the place except the house. At times you would get the feeling as if you were being watched. The feeling you got when someone was staring at you from across the room. My parents would always just tell my brother and I that it was just an old house and our imaginations were getting the best of us. We would notice strange things happening like our porch swing swinging when no wind was blowing. Ooh. My stepdad would just laugh it off and saying it's the ghost of Mrs. Mule, who was just someone who he had made up and he would laugh it off. <laughs> Very funny stepdad. Fast forward to me being 17, I'm lying in bed and felt my cat, Samson, that I had had for over 10 years, walking up the blankets covering my legs. I turn my back to shush him off the bed because he is keeping me awake. At that moment, something grabbed my shirt and it was so tight around my chest that it was hard to breathe. I tried moving and couldn't. I tried screaming and couldn't. I hear something right in my face and the most demonic voice you could imagine scream, get out, bitch. I was terrified. Although I had never been religious, my mom was, and she used to have a picture with the Lord's prayer on it. After seeing it many times, I knew it by heart and just started repeating it over and over in my head. After the third or fourth time, I felt pressure release. I ran to my mom's room and slept on the floor beside her bed that night. I understand sleep paralysis. This was different. I felt myself fall hard backwards onto the pillow. I felt the pillows bounce when I landed on the bed. My parents were already in the process of selling this home and moving because my brother and I were graduating, so they were downsizing. A few years after the house sold, I remember bringing up the night I slept by their bed, expecting them to say sleep paralysis or that it was nothing I had heard so many times before growing up. To my surprise, my mom and stepdad proceed to tell me about how the house was haunted. They said not long after we moved in, they had hung a pic of the Lord's Supper up only to awake in the middle of the night with the picture across the room and broken into a thousand pieces. When my brother and I would be out as teens, my mom said that she would lay in bed and hear us come in, hear the door lock, hear cabinets open, faucets coming on like we had come in at curfew and got a drink before going to bed. She would get up to double check the doors locked only to find the door not locked and my brother and I not home. My stepdad said that the fire alarm used to be a family run farm. Apparently the man who built the house and originally owned the farm had treated women horribly. He would abuse his own mother and wife and was just known in the small community as a mean man. He died in the back bedroom of that house, my old bedroom of cancer. That's when the older couple who sold the house to my parents bought it. After selling the house, the new owners added to it and changed it quite a bit. My dad knew them personally, so asked them once he was visiting if they had ever experienced anything unusual. They told him no, but I feel like they may not have been completely truthful. They, a couple who were high school sweethearts, ended up divorcing within one year of moving in there. I'm sorry about the lawnmower, you guys. I live in a rental. They're mowing the property. I can't do anything about it. <laughs> so I'm really sorry if you hear that in the background. Hopefully my mic is good enough that it's not too bad. That was from Anonymous. That is terrifying, especially because of course it's in the Appalachia area. Everything there is haunted in my opinion. That's hyperbole, but you know what I mean. I personally wouldn't think that a couple getting divorced 
after moving in there had anything to do with the house, just personally, just because it's like most high school sweethearts are going to get divorced. People change too much in their adulthood. I mean, like just the mere fact that our brains aren't fully developed until we're 25. I fully believe that most high school sweethearts are not going to just stay together forever with absolutely no problems in perfect monogamy because they were kids when they get together, right? So I don't personally think that is necessarily part of the haunting. However, what you experienced in your bed is absolutely terrifying, I will say. And the fact that your parents also validated that later, I think it's most convincing that they validated it by not telling you at the time. Like they didn't tell you until you were out of the house and safe because they obviously didn't want to scare you while you were in the house. So, so scary. I love a good farmhouse, big acre haunted story. Okay, this is story number five. This is going to be our last story for today. Hi, Hannah. If you read this, I'd like to remain anonymous, please. This story is from when I was in the fifth grade. It was summer vacation then, and it's about my mom's crazy ex-boyfriend. For some background, my sister was in the seventh, and my brother was in the eighth. My grandparents lived two streets away from us. We lived in a small town, and this all happened in broad daylight. Anyway, my older siblings and I were home alone that day because my mom had work, and my brother was supposed to be watching my sister and I. Obviously, that didn't happen, and my brother, G, stayed inside his room so it was my sister l watching me we had this small older house with an unfinished basement at the time the electrical box outside i was on the family computer down there while l was on the couch after some time of us taking turns playing games on it l went upstairs to get a snack from the kitchen our basement stairs were right in front of our side door and to the right was our small narrow kitchen above the sink and the tables were windows It took a few seconds before I heard rushed footsteps and came back down the stairs. Elle grabbed my shoulder and she looked the most scared I think I've ever seen her. Someone is looking through our window. I thought she was trying to scare me like older sisters do. Elle dragged me up the stairs and made me duck when peeking around the corner and there he was. The man was tall and was wearing an orange camouflage cap. He had his hands pressed against the window so he could peek in more. Ew, that's so creepy. He didn't look confused. He looked annoyed. You could just tell he was not there to ask if he could borrow anything. He wasn't even our neighbor. Even if I can't confirm it, I swear to God, he saw us. We ran back down to the basement and after a couple of minutes of panicked whispers asking each other if we knew the man, the power went out. Of course it did. The basement went dark and I almost screamed if Elle didn't cover my mouth. Neither of us had phones at the time. The only person who did was G. Elle and I quietly walked upstairs again, and she made sure that the side door was locked, the one we usually used. The man was gone from the window, but we still crawled through the kitchen just in case. When we entered the hallway of our house that led to the attic, my sister and my room, the bathroom, living room, and the two other bedrooms, the man was at our front door now and just trying to get inside. Our front door had a glass window, so you could see through it pretty well, and you could hear him jiggling the doorknob. Dear Lord, that is so scary. I would have been, I say pee my pants a lot, but I would have been peeing my pants. Elle grabbed my arm and we barged into G's room who hadn't realized the power was off because he was in his dark room playing on his DS. We told him what was going on and he for some reason didn't believe us so he walked to the end of the hallway to take a look and he saw the man looking through another window. He obviously reacted WTF no I'm not dealing with that and he called our grandpa. My grandpa was pissed off and he broke some traffic rules to rush over to make sure that the guy didn't actually break in. I'm guessing that the man either saw my grandpa's work van speeding towards our house or he recognized the house so we got in his car and took off out of there turns out that guy was my mom's most recent ex-boyfriend he had been stalking her for a year and he was the same guy who let me at my birthday party at his ranch so my friends and i could ride horses in an attempt to protect us from that knowing she was being stalked and scaring us my mom never told us not even my older brother god only knows what could have happened if we left the doors unlocked like we usually would in a small town like ours or if i took my sister's offer to play on the swings outside that day and you said your electrical box was on the outside of the house meaning he was the one that likely made the power go out that he likely turned off something in the power box to make it dark That's so scary. See what I'm saying, you guys? Like, real life is more... I'd rather have a ghost any day. 
I'd rather have a ghost haunt me than this shit. That's so scary, especially as a kid home alone and some creepy guy is peeking in the window at two young girls. Ew. I hope that your mom is okay. I really hope that she was able to get a restraining order and that it worked and that he left her alone because that is so unbelievably creepy. And that's what I think too is God knows what would have happened if she was home and he saw her or if the doors were unlocked and he was able to like get close to you guys, like what he would have done. Oh, I hate that. I'm so sorry that happened to you. That is so terrifying. Sometimes, you know, sometimes stranger than fiction. Is that what the phrase is? Sometimes straight, wait, stranger than fiction. I don't know what I'm saying. That's terrifying. Why are men? <laughs> okay, that's going to be it for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you like these videos. I want to make a nice big bingeable channel for everybody who likes listening to these. I know a lot of people like listening to these while they do arts or other stuff. And I just love that. I just love that because I love content like that. And I'm always looking for big playlists or content like this to binge. So I'm trying to make it for you guys too. So, okay, I'm going to stop blabbering. We're going to see you guys later. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, bye.